Thank you. That is, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to speak here, like about the abundant and all in conjecture. I think at least I will say two of us. Uh, so it's joint work with Frank Cargari and Vasily Dimitrov. And it's two of us, it means Vasily and I learned about the abundant and all conjecture from Wao Chen while we were members here a long time ago. So we just feel it's a great pleasure to talk about this work. Okay, so let me get started to state our main result and I'll talk a little bit about the proof. So for the sake of clarity, I'll just spell out the definition of module form. Thanks. Uh, it comes a special function on the up half plane, so of weight k and uh, level gamma. Gamma is a finite index subgroup of SL2C, such that you have to transition law, we have theta plus b over theta plus c equals to theta plus c to the k, here the weight comes in, for every element in the level two gamma. And the second is just a make life easier later, well, let me assume that F is locally meromorphic. That all the classes. If you want to well talk at the arithmetic groups similar, so you may see some of the things similar there. Uh, okay, so one thing is like, once we have a module form, and if we just uh, consider at the cusp infinity, we can look at the free, so called the free expansion of the module form. And of course, in this day, I'll just assume it's homomorphic, although it doesn't matter for proof and the method, but just for simplicity, I'll assume that it's homomorphic. At the cusp of i infinity, and then we can write it as a free expansion start from n equals to zero to infinity q to the one over n. Here, q okay, to cheat a little bit, I will use q to the e to the pi i tau instead of to two pi tau, which is more standard in the literature. And then here, the n is the it depends on whether the width is even odd. If it's half of the width of the cusp. You can take off your mask if you want. It, it, I don't know if someone told you. I think it. Um, okay. You have a small n over big n, q. Ah, sorry. And then we would like to talk about like two different types. No. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> different types of the finite index of gamma. One is called the congruence subgroups, namely, is that uh, there exists n, intentional m using the same n. Uh, such that the principal congruence subgroup, namely the matrices congruence to the identity matrix mod n, is contained in gamma. And the second type is the non congruence subgroups, i.e., they're just the otherwise. And it goes back to, okay, let me just say the existence of non congruence subgroups, even the knowledge even goes back to the work of Klein many, many years ago. And uh, but later, I'll give some okay, examples. Okay, so one way goes back to the work of Arkin and uh, 
Clinton. So it was in a conference in 1968. Um, the proceeding actually was published in 71 that they proposed like one way to distinguish these two types of gammas. So namely it's like we look at study the Fourier coefficients of modular forms with level gamma. Okay. Of course a primitive uh, that every module forms of say level four level is definitely a module form of a smaller level. So we just to talk about the primitive ones and the Fourier coefficients. And these two types corresponding to In the current case, we would have so-called bounded denominator. Namely, is that this is okay. So we'll consider. Let me write it as F Q inside Q bar bracket Q. Okay. So one thing is like we could think about Q bar because like for any no, for any gamma, we actually could make it into a ramified cover over P1 ramified as three points. And, uh, and hence that kind of like phi the Bay maps, a base theorem, like you can have model defined over Q bar. And hence, like module forms are like global sections of certain line bundles there. So you could choose the basis of Q bar coefficients. And let's just look at these ones. So bounded denominator means that. Uh, indeed, FQ lies in. So I use Z bar to denote like the set, the ring of algebra integers. And it means that we, there exists some rational number which can, like, is the common denominator, a common multiple of the denominator for all the free coefficients. And then for the non congruent subgroup, they're corresponding to like unbounded denominators. I can just uh, say that F does not lie in Q tensor. Ah. So but essentially that's the conjecture. It says it's like as far as it's a primitive module form coming from an from a level of a non-congruent subgroup, then we expect that the denominators to be unbounded. And but before we move on to talk about our theorem and the proof, I'll first make a remark. Yes. Why do we have bounded denominator for the congruence case? And this is it. Basically, hat theory. Although I, about in this definition, I'm not meromorphic at all because but you can just multiply it by suitable cost forms and use the fact that the delta function and its inverse all has the coefficients, so it's just doesn't change anything. And then, so from hat theory, we know that we can actually um, write each module form as a finite. Linear conditions of hack eigenforms and the normalized hack eigenforms has algebraic free, co free coefficients to be algebraic integers. So that's fine. But I would like to mention somehow, like a different way that you could think about the proof, and that we can use like cat theory of like the definition of module forms as global sections of certain line models. And then we use like cat's maser, which is the integral model of these module curves and has to argue that these free coefficients has unbound, sorry, has bounded denominator. Hence, I would like to mention the work of Watson that for the non-congruence case, uh, unbounded denominators only 
happen at finite limiting primes as well. Just a topic yesterday that for this part you don't really need any kind of fancy things. You can just say that exists a big map, but for finite many primes, which divides the cardinality, the size of certain group. So let me say a little bit. This will be a finite. We talk about non congruence non abelian group. Basically, in Will's thesis, he tells you one way how to kind of like uh, give a modular interpretation of non congruence curves in terms of elliptic curves with G structures. So for each gamma, there's some way that you could find a G or some, for some G that you associate to gamma. And once you have an idea what this group G is, then you would have known because he gave a modular interpretation into the model and hence you would know that the unbounded denominators only happens at the finite many primes which divides the order of G. Okay. I mean, not write this down, but just uh, make a remark is that, so this basically says this is how much, essentially how much we could do using the second method to prove bounded denominator for the congruence case. And how about the first method? How about hack theory? Essentially, it's like if you use the, just the, the classical way to define hack operators using the local sets and X are uh, these like model forms of um, ga level gamma, and then model congruence module form, I mean like module form congruence level, then you get zero. Um, I think that's still a conjecture of RP and approved by in a series of work starting from zero, finished by Gabriel Berger. We'll mention their work a little bit later. But now let me just uh, state the main theorem. So essentially repeat what I said, namely that the way that Arkin and Shrandai propose to distinguish these two types of groups really works. So if we have a module form, we look at its three coefficients, and that's just multiplied by this kind of rational number there. So assume that it has algebra coefficient. Algebra integer coefficients. Then F is a modular form of congruence step. And as far as you have a modular form with bounded denominator, then it must be a modular form of some congruence group. Okay, so, so we can check this is about module form, not about a common. So like it's about like you have they basically in their paper they give you basically three they, they propose it as three different ways to distinguish congruence and non congruence subgroups. And one way they propose is to look at the module forms. But if it starts with the gamma, right? So when you do you imply that gamma is a yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I start from gamma, it doesn't imply gamma is congruence because like but sorry. If let me say if it's a module form of let me reformulate this as if this is a primitive module form of level gamma, then gamma is congruence. It doesn't come from a larger group containing gamma. Yeah, because I can't say a module form of low level is a module form for any finite index subgroup. But your gamma is in SRTZ, right? Yeah. yeah. So the maximum is SRTZ. Yeah, yeah. But your definition of congruent already implies. Right? Huh? Yeah. No. So for instance, let me just give you. Okay. So example. <laughs> Although it's kind of like I won't be able to just uh, uh, did we put this in our paper. Anyway, so if you look at the J function and you take the fifth roots 
and then you can still write it as uh, let me say q coefficient power series with q to the one over five and in this case you say that first is like a computer can help you compute what the coefficients are you see this one has unbounded denominator Oh, this result I think is oh, okay. It's, this is a clockwise equal result, like for like roots of like J functions, these type of things. It's more classical than just the general other module forms. And on the other hand, because this is an algebra function in J, and hence it's a rational function over some like finite cover, and that rational that finite cover course give you a subgroup, finite index subgroup of SL2Z. And hence, it's a module form of that whatever finite index subgroup, and that one is non congruence And the argument that now I give somehow use the theorem saying that because you can compute the Fourier coefficient, seeing that it is unbounded, hence this group is fine. But in this case, you have other easy ways to prove that it's a non congruence group. Uh, sorry, so in this conjecture by Arkin and Spring Nevada, so how did they come up with this? So did they, they did lots of computations. Experiments. Yeah, I see. Uh, I mean, they know hex theory, uh, and they did a lot of computations. Okay. Yeah. So first, maybe to answer your question, the, the J function is also a non-congruence modular form. Oh, right. In the sense that, so. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that, that's, okay. that's what. what okay. That's what yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now let me first make just a no. Sorry, no. Sorry, this is an example of your non congruence. Of, so, sorry, this is a okay, non congruence module form. Congruence of contents. Uh, it's, it's some covering, but it's ramified in, in the interior somewhere. It's not in the interior. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, it, it is yes, 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 it is right. You're right. It is right by the interior. Oh uh, yeah, covering means ref. Okay, whenever I talk about covering this talk, it can be ramified. That doesn't correspond to the program. No, wait. So proper. Can only allow ramification of order two. Oh, this one doesn't. I think. Wait. Maybe some other root of J. Uh, let me. If we take 24 instead of 5, I guess you will be. Able to... If I take anything device 24, I'll give a congruence of group. Yes. But let me just uh, do another one, which should be fine. Oh, wait, give me a second. That one is definitely okay. Yeah. Sorry. Lambda, let me just say lambda is the lambda. No. Does it avoid zero? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, and I need to take something which I think doesn't divide eight. Okay, no. Yeah, this theorem is reduced to to weight. Zero case. Now that's why, like at the beginning, of the definition we are now meromorphic being cusp, so that we can divide it by some um, module forms, and uh, some module forms uh, by some module sign namely means that the delta function you can divide it by you can multiply by something such that it has like weights divisible by twelve, and you divide it out by the delta function, and hence like can reduce to the weight zero case. And how typically how does this p valuation at a, at a denominator grow? Is it will typically grow linearly with the if you or I would how, how bad are the denominators? I would think so. Yeah, but okay. will, yeah. Will it come out of your proof? Some? Uh, no. Okay. That's a good question. Okay. I, I think Vesslin mentioned in an email. Yeah, today. yeah, yeah. Uh, we cannot prove that yet. I mean, oh. okay, we can prove something, but not. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, oh, okay. I'll mention, Bessing is also here. He may say more, like after I mentioned the vague version. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to mention a vague version and Bessing probably will like remark on what is the precise version we get. Um, okay. 
uh, uh, reduced to the way zero case. And uh, yeah, let me just first remark is the proof is to some extent effective, hence it gives us some information about the denominator. So we don't need to have like integer coefficients, we can have like with some very mild denominator. Okay. Ah, okay. The bound we get is also, okay, let me first give the answer. The bound we get is also linear, but somehow it is like, depends on n. So it's like the coefficient is very small. Okay, so here's like, we reduce to the weight zero case. And uh, so with zero case, what do we know? It's an algebra function in terms of, okay, since I already talked about, forget about J function in this talk. That's the reason why we do e to the pi i tau. So in this term, we're using the agenda modular lambda function. Okay, so then f is actually, let me write this down. So in this case, uh, f is an algebraic function. Name it i e of i, uh, let me just say in lambda. This is one thing we know that's not very helpful. The other thing that we know is, let me just stick with the case that A is the cusp width. So let me just stick with the case that the cusp toy mod, toy example. So the cusp width at i infinity equals to two, which means that we can write and for simplicity, I'll just write f with z coefficient. Later on the proof, we'll see that um, can just working with certain functions with z coefficients and finish the proof. So this is a typical case. And then one thing, let me just uh, say that you can Wikipedia the definition of the agenda modular, and this thing has the property we're going to use. It's, it's Q times Z double bracket. So that's the only property that we're going to use here, which means that the power series ring with Z coefficient in terms of Q is the same as the power series ring with Z coefficient in terms of lambda over 16. Now we have a function which is an algebra in terms of lambda, and we have a function which, which we want to view it as a power series, it has a z coefficients. So that's related to the second part of the talk, which is called, which is like one important input. So the name suggests that it has something to do with this function f to be an algebra function, but I would like to start from a very simple fact. Okay. Yes, now we consider f, let me just use the coin x. So f is a power series with coin with coefficients in z. And then if uh, R infinity, which is going to be the convergence radius of F, let me just say as a power series with C coefficient, or I should use R coefficients as the completion at infinity, but doesn't matter. So if this is the convergence radius of F, and if this is greater than one, then F is a polynomial. This is easy because you just use the formula that what does it mean by convergence radius greater than one? It means like for like n large enough, the absolute value of a n is smaller than one. You only have one integer, zero. Good. And uh, but oh, but this doesn't apply to this case. 
because that although like as power series ring, these two things are the same, but like so if we write so this is if we write Q as a say if we write a Q inside the Z bracket lambda over 60, then we see that it only converges in the disk D0 1 over 16. So center at 0 radius 1 over 16, because lambda doesn't hit 1. So divided by 16, 1 over 16. That's too small. I mean, in a sense, unless you have some information saying that uh, for this type of model, form or some function once kind of rewrite it as a power series in terms of Q plugging this kind of trivial bound, we get some kind of extra like convergence. Otherwise, like generically, we'll say convergence radius is one over 16. So it's too far away from one. Yeah. That's why I like uh, if we talk about history, which I think Frank probably so. So Peter asked like uh, Frank Lesson and I to talk about in the arithmetic group seminar. And I think next week from what Wednesday, Frank will talk a little bit in between from this simple fact to what I'm going to say now. But today, for the sake of time, I'm going to like jump to the next thing. Okay, so the short answer is okay. 1 over 16 is too small, but we really have a disk. If we don't talk about greater than 1, we just talk about if we just want some radius equals to 1, then we can use the disk Q. A Q disk has radius 1. So which means it's like we're not talking about just a, a disk inside the x coordinate, we're talking about a map from a disk to the x coordinate. So this is actually a theorem of eventually which already showed up in his book in 1989, and was somehow, let's say, a more clean write-up version in his paper, um, Certain Key Curvature Conjecture in 2004 in the work volume. Um, everything that's in, basically in this section, works not just for like parsers with Z coefficient. You can think about Z as you have convergence radius equals to one, for all the finite primes. So you can use like convergence radius and some measurements about denominators to, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll write this up soon. Anyway, it's like, it doesn't need to be Z coefficient. You can make a more symmetric criterion by talking about convergence radius at other primes. So does the work of Ivan J. That's the general version of his formulation. So here I'm just going to give a simple version. Still for, with Z coefficients. And if there exists a phi from the unit disk to C, and here I use Z to denote the coordinates, such that some normalization condition, phi zero equals to zero. So convergence radius is just the largest disk centered at zero. I mean, the zero you pick. And then so we are such that convergence. So F, when we pull back by phi as a power series in Z is homomorphic. Okay, so that's described, namely a fancy version of my, a generalization of convergence radius. Now I'm going to give you what's the radius. So the radius is actually just the derivative at zero and greater than one. If there exists a such a phi, then F is algebraic over So It's not hard to believe. In a sense, it's like, what is like polynomial? It's kind of a rational function. So we just talk about disk inside the X line. Here we are now like, Cover, not cover maps, just the maps to C doesn't necessarily need to be injective, and hence the conclusion will be as algebraic. Okay. But then compare this one to this toy example here. I owe you two things. 
First, I still haven't tell you how to find something which derivative is greater than one instead of equals to one. We can use the Q, the, the lambda map to replace the phi there, where these have derivative equals to one, so which means we're not too far. It's better than the one over 16 here. And second is that the conclusion, even if I tell you such a map, the conclusion so far is not useful. It says that this function is algebraic. We know that the weight zero module form is an algebra function in terms of lambda. But I would like to make a remark. Is if you look at the proof, it's not very hard to see that his proof is actually effective. So effective in the sense is like the proof. Yes. And upper bound of the algebraic degree of f uh, in terms of, I vaguely say in terms of five. Okay, now that's, that's good because Why is this good for us? So let me just uh, before give our refinement. So, so I'm going to give our refinement of this criterion. But before giving our refinement, I would like to say, what are we going to kind of bound? What do we know? OK, so could you give us a little hint how, how this is proved? Yes, I, I will. Okay. Let me finish this by lot. I will remark on that and then motivate the statements of our criteria. Okay. So let's just go back to model forms. Well, I think it's like next week, Frank and Vesson are going to give talks and Vesson will give us a complete proof. Um, back to modular forms. It's like, so let me enlarge N so that N is the so-called uh, every time I will. To make sure it's Full fat level of gamma, which equals to the LCM of cusp width. And then, so this N is just the N for the principal congruence subgroup. So what do we know is my uh, the dimension over, let me just say Q lambda of all the, uh, let me just span, okay, just the congruence module forms with zero module forms of gamma such that the level so let me say the whole fat level divides n. Okay. So how many of them? Like the worst uh, group you can get for congruence of group that of whole fat level n is just the uh, gamma n. That's the worst you can get. Okay, so this is just uh, the index of gamma n inside gamma two, let me just so uh, we may assume two divides n, but we may assume because later on we're going to do asymptotic. So if I replace n by two, n doesn't change the asymptotic. So this is roughly n cube. So this is the goal that we try to find is if we can actually talk about, so now it's like what we want is essentially saying, Bound for the span of f inside z bar bracket q to the one over n instead of talking about the congruence ones. So we want to get an uh, upper bound of the dimension of the module forms with bounded denominator associated to a group gamma whose wolf at level device n. If we can prove that the dimension of these functions, the span of these functions, the dimension over Q lambda is the same as this one, then we don't see any other functions. So that's the ideal world. 
But the actual situation is that we're going to give some bump, which is not exactly like this one. So the actually is like, so let me use this part of the Bible, sorry. So two parts is like, we get a bound, which is n cubed log n. And second, we say that one counterexample of the congruence embodied denominator conjecture gives many. So which means that if you have a counterexample, you want to just have as small a deficient as log n. And that will give the uh, contradiction. I'll elaborate on this part later. But now it's like, go back to Akshay's question. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, just a one line proof. And that will motivate our algebraicity question. So, OK, how would you prove something is can, algebraic? Can you, can you, sorry, can you say a word? Uh, Wolfa, I think, had a characterization of congruent subgroup in terms yeah. of the level. Sorry? What was Wolfhard's characterization? So gamma is a finite index subgroup. It's congruence. He has got a characterization in terms of this level, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, that's what I said. It's like, if you take this cusp width to be n, then the smallest congruence subgroup you can get is gamma n. Ah, OK. Thanks. Yes. So proof. This proof will be very sketchy and probably doesn't make much sense, but I just want to give you an idea about what will show up in our requirement. So how to prove something as algebra is that a sentence by a polynomial with coefficients in QX. So it's C1, F, F squared, up to F to the N, M very large. And then we get, we consider, we somehow we want a, a Z, let me just uh, control something, ZX linear combination F of all these one to of fm. So here we use zero lemma, which I'm going to tell you why we need to use zero lemma is we want two things. Is we want f to has uh, high vanishing order at zero. So let me just uh, say, okay. And the second is like we want f to has a small coefficients. So coefficients are polynomials inside the x. Small means two things. Degree is small. The coefficients are small. So that's what essentially zero lemma is about. And then, so what is x here? X. X. Same x. The f is a module form, right? Uh. F is a model form, X is lambda over 16. <laughs> but we can think about any power series. Here it's just any power series. Okay, and then so now we do arithmetic. It's like as far as they are, they are not linearly dependent, which means that you definitely have some like, uh, let me just say, let me say alpha is the order at zero of F. And then we can look at the alpha's coefficients. By alpha's coefficients, I mean the, the coefficients of x to the alpha. And the addition, yes, okay. Yeah, so the coefficient is definitely not zero. So we know that this coefficient, when we take absolute value, it's at least one, okay? And on the other hand, we are doing complex analysis phi. So we just pull back, we consider, F phi z on the disk d zero one, and then we can use Cauchy integration formula or maximum principle or whatever things you want to do using the fact that these coefficients also have small coefficients will give us a bound, an upper bound, and then you get some contradiction because from the zero lemma you could make the coefficients very very small. Yep. So that's kind of a bad sketchy of proof, but at least it's like, we can at least have some idea is like, the what's going to show up in the effective version is like, you'll have the derivative, 
the derivative of phi at zero. And the other is that uh, x, because if I do maximum principle in terms of z, and then here I just uh, talking about like polynomials inside x, so it'll be like, what is the maximum of x when I take z to be on a, say a small disk, smaller than one. Yeah. So these are the ingredients which will show up in our pattern. And what was the statement of the Ziegel lemma? If f is high vanishing order and small coefficients, then what? Oh, no. I mean, the Ziegel lemma will give you small coefficients. Oh, then it has small coefficients. Yeah. Small related to the vanishing order. Um, I'll use this platform to indicate because the statement of the theorem is a little bit complicated. So I'm just going to tell you how we're going to use it for the model. Okay. So first, the setup is we have an integer n which is the wolf at level. And then, so previously we have the happy coincidence that the power series ring Z in terms of Q and the lambda over 16 are the same, but when we have N, then they are not the same. So that's why we have two set of notations is I'll change my notation a little bit so that F of T equals to T plus, so the first leading term is T and inside the bracket t such that x t to the n has z coefficients. So t is just q to the one over n because we're talking about power series in one q to the one over n. And then x here will be lambda over 16 to the one over n. I'm going to explain why we're doing this one over n later, but bear with me. Okay. So then it's like one way somehow, as in the lambda example, one way to control somehow is like how large a phi could be. It's like if we know somehow a priori that phi need to avoid some points inside C, need to avoid kind of one over 16. So here is like, so you will be a set containing zero containing C open such that we have our phi as a map, okay. So for the notation here, it means like we take the closed disk, but when we do complex analysis, it means holomorphic on an open neighborhood of this closed disk. So phi is a map from P01 to U, such that still the same normalized condition and the derivative greater than one. So in our case, I'll first tell you, u will be equals to, so in the lambda case, the lambda map is avoid one over 16, okay? But now we take the nth root, so I have one over n, mu n. Now we consider all the functions f inside bracket x such that yes, we're talking about module forms. So when we kind of, so t is our like q, so this one has z coefficients as a t module form. And the second is f when we take back phi z is holomorphic. Um, D01. So we consider all these functions, and then the span of we span over Q x to the n, span x to the n or, or such f, and we talk about the dimension 
over um, qx to the n. So the dimension is bounded by So the derivative show up on the denominator because it's like the larger the disk you could choose, the better. And then on the numerator, previously we talked about that we look at phi z and talking about ups, uh, the absolute value of z equals to one, and we talk about the absolute value of this one. And here, instead of taking the maximum, we can actually replace it by the integration we do log plus and with respect to the higher measure. And there's a E factor, yeah, which is just a constant. So in particular, they're all algebraic of at most that degree. Yes, exactly. Okay, so one thing is that I'll just uh, I'll just a clear talk, say this dot can be replaced. Because I already introduced you saying that F sentence by a linear ODE with without singularities in U. Well, that's related to the choice of like U being like C minus in C minus one over sixteen because it's like there's two different things. It's like lambda. So the hypergeometric um, differential equation for lambda function is that has singularity at zero, one, and infinity. But so that's like one somehow has already been ruled out. Infinity is never here. And then how about zero? And that's the upshot. That's why we take the one over n. We will like to kind of resolve the singularity at zero, not for the differential equation, but since we have an algebra function, we know the local model drawing. So actually that's the part. Let me continue here is saying that so, so record, so F is, so for our more, um, for modular form, F um, uh, level gamma with the low fat level N, it means that the actually so the local monodromy of f lambda over sixteen at zero because zero corresponding to i infinity uh, uh, doesn't matter when corresponding to one of the cusps and the, way the wall flower level is about the cusp width of all the cusps. So the local monodromy of so the degree of the local monodromy the, the, at zero divides n. And hence, when we do the change of coordinates x by x to the n, taking n's root, we so no singularity. So I think I explained to you everything except what is phi. <laughs> because like, we can use Q, but it only gives us a derivative equals to one. We want something derivative greater than one. But that is OK, because we already know what is U. I'll just tell you how to. We already resolve the singularity at 0. And hence, we have U. So let me just say, what is our math phi? Phi is a math from D01 to U. And how about we just take the, in order to, to have the largest possible derivative at zero, we just take five to be the universal coverage. So, why is the universal cover has derivative greater than one? Because lambda is a map, but the lambda is not. So the lambda from Q to, uh, ah, actually, let me just write down. So 
What this is because we can take d zero one to u. This u depends on n, and then we let uh, say q to the one over n maps to lambda over sixteen. This is q to the one over n. You can check it makes sense to write it as a power series as a homomorphic function. So this one has derivative equals to one, but this is not a like this is not a covering map because zero is the only preimage of zero, and hence like the universal cover will have derivative greater than one. So we at least conclude that all these functions are algebraic. Um, talking about this is like I think you can apply. So in our paper, we also mentioned you can apply this criterion to so-called um, the vector value module forms congruence. Sorry, coming from rational conformal what's theory. And there, people have conjectures on those like vector value module forms. And without further computation, we can conclude that these module forms are at those ones that they with z coefficients are algebraic. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes, let me just uh, tell you. So here we already reached the point that it is they are algebraic, but we want to actually know what this bound is. Okay. So let me just talk more about phi. Actually, how do we choose phi? We're going to choose phi to be like this. It's like we take first the universal cover. Let me denote this math by fn to the un. Oh, sorry. Actually, I would like to normalize it in a slightly different way. And then we'll take a small closed disk inside it. This will be our phi. So first thing is like uh, the derivative of phi at zero will be just r times the derivative of f. Okay. So let me first give one example. If we take a equals to two, if we take a equals to two. It's like c minus plus c minus plus minus one. So you can kind of Check all it, make it into uh, 0, 1, infinity, take the lambda map, and then the derivative will be the derivative at a CM point, and that you can use like charles silver formula to compute or, or other whatever ways that you can actually compute like what the derivative is. It all depends on the gamma function, and that's actually the case in general. Um, I'll just, uh, we give a self contained proof in our paper, but actually after we send out our paper to some people. If I point out to us, actually for people study like these like complex variables functions, there's a paper by Krauss and Ross. They actually already computed, so. Equals to, so in terms of gamma functions. I'll put the formula here, but uh, the next thing I'm going to say that asymptotic is more important than the formula itself. Asymptotic is not surprisingly we have 16 to the one over n because that's what kind of the lambda one, one over 16 gives us. And then we get one plus Theta three over two n cube, so something positive. The other terms that you can write as like powers of n and uh, um, special values of zeta function. So, okay. So is this related to something called five of something? Oh, this one doesn't. I mean, in fact, the previous one, yes, because like that one, you have like potential good reduction everywhere. So the Archimedean computation is exactly for floating heights. That's why you can use Charles oh, okay. to do it. Oh. Um, but this one is not. But mm, it's related to actually uh, the possible way to do it is like uh, the this math can be realized as a quotient of two solutions of certain differential equations. And uh, in the case for a equals to two, it's just uh, the uh, hypergeometric equation associated 
to the lambda function is f a half a half one. And there's other hypergeometric functions which are used to compute this. Yeah. Okay. So upshot is that if we take a log times zero, it will be log r. So I'm not going to take r too small and plus. Oh, I need to take a normalized. Uh, yeah, so there's another. So phi will be. Okay, plus uh, some constant. Let me just put a constant c times log. I'm oh, sorry, not log. N to the minus. Yeah. Uh, coming from the n cube here. So as far as we take R such that uh, it's also, so we're going to take R to be one minus C prime over N cubed. So as far as we take R to be this, C prime small enough, it will give us the N cube. Oh, sorry. There's one thing that I missed. And then now we talk about the numerator. Sorry, so, so what do you, what, what, how much do you need of this SM product? You, is what you need is that- We just need that you are greater than one plus something, okay. some constant over N cube. Yeah. Okay, so this is about the denominator. Ah, this part is supposed to be section three. And uh, and uh, we talk about numerator. I only have three minutes, so I will not talk too much about the numerator and this hand waving thing that please come to either Vasily is going to talk about that or Frank and I are going to talk about it on December first. Um, so numerator. I'll just give you a big word to indicate that we can actually do it. It's actually the this kind of integration goes on the circle of the log plus of certain functions with respect to the high measure is actually the so called the Navenina approximate function. And the answer we get, instead of talking about phi, let me just sort of replace it by the fn and the put z equals to r here. We can actually give a symptotic bound to be the log, the log is outside, log n over one minus r. So in the Vedas classical work, there's some asymptotic which is for fifth n, that R vary, it has more asymptotic on that. So, but we need a asymptotic depending on n, which one of the input is coming from um, re reduce this one to the approximate function for some log derivatives. So this one we don't know how to estimate on the nose. But once we reduce it to the log derivatives, using the fact that Fn is highly symmetric, we can like reduce it to the approximate function for log derivatives and uh, from like a key lemma in the Proof of the second main theorem of Navina theory. He gave a very sharp bound on how to control the process function for log derivatives. And hence, we have this bound. So now, previously, we said that r, 1 minus r, is 1 over n cube. So this is log n to the fourth, which is log n. So we put things together, we get, uh, ah, yeah, I still have one minute, great. So putting these two things together, we get the promised bound, n cube log n. How do we finish the proof? Is that, so if, is a counterexample. Let me let me just yeah. Let me just say counterexample. 
example of WOLFAP level N. And then we can actually prove, so here use the work of Sarah where he actually used back the work of himself on, not himself, so the other work on the congruent subgroup property of SL2Z adjoint one over P. And also we also need a version in the thesis of Gabriel Berger. And plus some extra work, we actually can prove that if we consider FQ to the one over P, so first they still have like bounded denominator is a country example level, so the Wolfart level divides P times N. Sorry, I take a P not divides N. And immediately independent over all the congruence ones. Namely that if we have a counterexample, then if we replace Q by Q to the one over P, we get another counterexample, which is linearly independent from the previous one. Now, let me just say, do we take M to be the product from primes P not divides N up to a capital X? So we have two parts, is like the upper bound is still m q log m. Okay, and then and the lower bound is we start from level n. Sorry, we start from the okay, we start from the congruence ones first. And then we start from level n. It's like from level n to level m for each prime p. You can either choose p to be there, not to be there. So we have two to the uh, number of such p. And then you can just use prime number theorem to just uh, take the symptomatic. This one will be m cubed to be true to the prime number theorem gives us like x over log x, but let me put a true here to just uh, make things okay here. And there you still use the prime number theorem and this part will give us m cubed x. Sorry, where did that m cubed come from at the bottom? Oh, the congruence ones. So the congruence ones also has always have bounded denominator. Okay. Yeah. And then we have the non congruence to be like independent or linearly independent. Let's oh, I see you're multiplying them all together. Yes. Oh. Sorry, no, not, not multiple. Oh, it's like oh, in yeah. the sense, it's Q to the one over P1, P2. Oh, I, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see what I'm saying. I, okay, let me think about how would I to say it. Um, ah, ah, sorry. What, not, what that we actually, let me be a little bit more precise. What we actually proved is the following. Okay, so, so this is a kind of a sloppy way to say it. What we actually proved is we proved that the total one, if I have level P times, let me just say N prime, and over the total of P over the total N prime is always equal to true. And this N prime that we can like take it to start from N, we can take N times P, N times P1, N times P2 going. Uh, wait, oh, oh sorry, oh, sorry. It's the total one of this one, total one of this times the congruence ones. Oh. Yes, sorry. It's like you, you count whatever you can already count. And then the rest is true whenever you add a prime. 
So it's in the independence of some product. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a very vague, bad way to say it. So you, the correct way is like you start from this level, you put all the congruent ones, and then you talk about the total ones. It's it's at least true. And hence the true constant. And then you see that this one gets much larger than this one, and we get a contradiction saying that we should not have any count examples to begin with. And uh, that's the proof. Sorry for going over time. Thank you very much. Uh, question? Uh, the last part. Uh, the last part is a uh, kind of amplification method uh, that's uh, that if you have a bad guy then it'll exist yeah, yeah. at a very deep level and then you do uh, this remarkable counting with with niven lina theory to bound it and, it, yeah. and the prime number theorem uh I, I missed one point you are you winning by a log i didn't see the last step ah. the, the contradiction yeah so Contradiction is like here, the lower bound from prime number zero, you have two to the power of x over something. And maybe just to say two to the root x power. And this one is like x. Yeah, so, okay, okay, right. So you have enough fronts. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh. I'm glad we have some follow up lectures on it so that we can follow <laughs> all the details. <laughs> Sorry, I like, ignore so many details. Sorry about it. So concerning the refinement of Ampere's theorem, so yes. uh, does it have some applications in quantum approximation? Yes, uh, you can prove the. It has a couple of applications. First, you can prove the solvable case for the Picard-Richard conjecture, and the second, you can be used uh, to prove that um, uh, the wrong version of ah yeah okay oh not this version. For oh, probably for elliptic curve is okay. It's like so. There is some version of these type of things can prove the uh, period conjecture for H one, the Grothendieck period conjecture for H one, which kind of you can reformulate as like linear relations of periods, and you can also use it to prove like uh um yeah you also need to upgrade it a little bit. These are in the work of Bost and some of them with his collaborators and about like uh, the wrong version of the floating size theorem, things like that. And yeah, it yeah, has lots of like different terms. Because you mentioned Ziegel's lemma, which is a crucial step in the Roth theorem. Yeah, yeah, oh, but we- Is this the same argument? Or? The only thing we use from Roth, that's a good question. The only thing we use from Roth, the difference between this proof and that proof is that for this proof, you can stick with one variable, but in order to get this bound, the only way we know how to get this bound is you need to work with infinitely many, sorry, many variables, d goes to d variables, d goes to infinity, in order to, to get this sharp bound. If you don't work with multi-variables, the, the best bound we can have from following here, let me use this particular example, will be worse than n to the six. That's the exact novelty of Roth. Yeah. Yeah but, yeah, but but yeah, but we we yeah, that's the only thing. We, we did not use anything beyond that along the line of Ross. Yeah. If you have some rational weight, not half integral, can you put one never as bounded denominator? Uh, not sure. Mm. We haven't explored that. Mm. Uh, let me just back to well, and actually, question about denominator. I mean, how how worse the denominator could be? I said like the proof is effective. And the answer is like uh, one thing I could put. Let me just uh, change this part. So instead of z coefficient, we say that a n lies in z over the l c n of one up to n to the tau tau is a real number and then we put tau here. yeah so, so that's why i said like the, the we can get some bound but it's 
pretty bad <laughs> at this moment. Because like the, the largest thing you could put here so far, because this one is n only like uh, n to the minus three, so we need to put something smaller than n to the minus three for the whole thing to work. Yeah, so it's it's effective, but so far not very good. <laughs> Uh, are there any more questions? Otherwise, the sex internet.